Great, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to VetSec uh, for allowing me to speak here today at VetSecCon 2020, which is awesome to see you guys doing your uh, first con. I think it's really, really great. And for those who know me, uh, you know how important it is uh, to give back uh, to our communities, especially for our veterans, right? Um, you know, it's, we're kind of, I don't want to call us a breed of our own, but we're kind of a breed of our own. And oftentimes we're left to take care of ourselves and, and one another. And it's because of that passion uh, and that persona that we, uh, you know, learn and, and mold and grow upon when we're in the service to really take care of, uh, you know, that man or woman who is to our left and our right. So uh, thank you, VetSec, for putting this on. It's a great organization. Uh, and, and it's great to have this here. So today we're going to talk about something that's really passionate uh, or that I'm really passionate about. And that's really uh, remembering where you come from, right? So, uh, you know, us in the, coming from the military, we really understand that, you know, don't leave any man or woman behind. Out here in the civilian world, it's a lot different. We, we don't necessarily see or hear uh, that mentality oftentimes in the workplace. It's, you know, very much uh, every man or woman for themselves, so to speak. And, you know, everybody's trying to, you know, claw and fight their way to the top. Uh, and, and they're forgetting that there's other people sitting there with them, uh, with them getting them there sometimes. So we're going to talk about that a bit. Again, I'm very, very passionate about it. And I think that it's something that we really don't see enough of out here on the civilian side. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Joe Helly, security engineer, a bunch of certificates. Uh, I'm just a guy who likes to hack computers, basically. Uh, let me see. Uh, our agenda, we know who I am. We'll talk about why we're here. Uh, enduring the suck, again, that's something us military members know all too well. Uh, we'll have some choices there at the crossroads. We'll talk about those choices. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of mentorship. Uh, I'll have some challenges for you, you know, kind of marching orders, and then we'll close up. Uh, hopefully, this will last about 30 minutes. I've got chat open. If anybody has any questions whatsoever, we can certainly stop, uh, you know, midway or uh, as your questions come in, I'm happy to talk uh, about your question or answer them uh, as we're going. I, if we can make this interactive, uh, that'd be great. So if anybody has anything while I'm talking, please interrupt uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it from there. Uh, I'm a security engineer at Integration Partners. I've been there three weeks now. I'm a former mayor, a moonshiner, and literally everything else. I've chased my tail for, uh, for about 10 years now, uh, trying to find my place here in the world. Uh, hopefully I've found it now. I'm a Twitch streamer. Uh, I'm a community mentor uh, in different communities. Uh, I have my own community on Discord as well as through my Twitch channel and on Twitter. I'm a community mentor with the Try Hack Me community. I'm an Army veteran. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, as an infantryman and as a sergeant. I'm a father and a husband and agent of change, which is one of those things that we're really going to talk about today uh, that I'm really, really passionate about. So, and again, we're here today because coming from that transition period from the military to uh, civilian world, we really have a challenge from what our perception of teamwork, progress, and success is sometimes from what the civilian uh, interpretation or definition of those things are. And so we're going to talk about that and really something that I've experienced over the last nine or 10 months. I have no idea why my screen is being wrote on. <laughs> uh, something we've, uh, I experienced and that we're going to talk about a bunch today is really the hiring aspect of IT and how, you know, it's really challenging and plagued by this narrow, almost narrow mindedness and gatekeeping, right? A lot of times we're, we're applying for jobs and we see three to five years experience for very entry level positions. We see, you know, all kinds of these crazy certifications that cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars uh, that are the only way in. Uh, and, and we get not, or we really don't have enough of people who will look back at where they came from and what they had to do to get where they are. Uh, and that's all they think about. I had to go through it, so should everybody else. And we don't really have enough people in the industry and in the civilian world in general uh, who look back at those struggles, trials, and tribulations and say, hey, I want to make it better for people who are coming after me. Uh, and again, people just too often forget what it was like to be the little guy. They don't want to be the little guy, so they got out of it as quickly as they possibly could. And now that they're not there anymore, it's not really a concern. If I had to do it, so should everybody else. And that's really the biggest challenge or struggle, in my opinion, in much of what we do is literally, you know, if you had to endure the pain, 
you know, everybody else who comes after you should. And we're going to talk about why that's not really the best thing. Because where does it get us? Well, security is in an entry level position. How would you ever know how to manage a SIM if you've never fixed printers first? I'm sorry, your credentials are important, but you lack the three to five years of experience for this entry level IT job. Where's your CISSP? If you've never worked a help desk, how would you ever be able to empathize with an IT team that you're pen testing? <laughs> These are things that I've been told from everyone. Um, okay, we'll stop really quick. Ian's got a question. How do we get around the ISC squared and other groups trying to gatekeep those through certifications? Are employers strong enough to take risks, especially with vets, but also young kids? Um, Ian Murphy, we will get to this uh, a little bit more in depth here in a few minutes, but in short, uh, it's going to take a couple of things, a lot of networking and a lot of cultural change. We really have to get back into the mindset of taking ownership of our industry, taking ownership of our processes, of our job and of our teams. And we can't do that if we just create lists, uh, uh, you know, checklists, and we rate people on a point scale versus on a personal scale or, or on a technical scale. And we really need to start looking at people more granularly like we used to. Uh, one of those big, you know, really big challenges is the HR process because we don't really get a chance to talk to anybody to sell our technical abilities, to prove our worth and our salt. Uh, and we're stuck by HR who uh, is simply tasked with weeding people out. So we need to get back to a process where we're talking to uh, people who make these decisions. We need to get back to the point where uh, we're not weeded out first before we get to talk to decision makers. We need those decision makers uh, to be a bit more interactive with the hiring process. The company I got hired to is exactly that. Uh, there's some companies, you know, the opportunities I received in the last month uh, that walked me into, you know, my current position, those companies were like that. But uh, here in a minute, we'll talk more about that struggle uh, and, and where we're at with that, uh, as well as a bit more about the certifications thing, Ian. So uh, great question. And, and if, uh, if I didn't expound upon it enough or expand upon it enough, please let me know and we can keep talking about it some more. And again, all these things on the screen, these are excuses I receive when applying for jobs. You know, over, you know, the course of the last several months, I applied for well over 50 positions and got those as responses. And, and it's just insane. Uh, so, you know, where does that get us again? Stale ideas and a lack of diversity leads to a lack of innovation. We don't ever get anywhere because everybody has the same skills, credentials, and ideas, right? We never have any change or differences in one another, and we can't build and improve our teams. Uh, it also lands us with a surplus of unfilled jobs and a bludgeoning talent pool. Uh, we end up with single training pathways that rule them all. Ian, that goes to your point. Uh, you know, if you live in a geographical area where uh, ISC squared is the you know, certificate of choice or the certificate path of choice, you might be stuck with certifications that are very expensive sometimes along with the training that, that you, know, you may have to do to get to that point. Same thing with CompTIA. If you, if you live in a geographical area where CompTIA is widely accepted, you really lose out on some other perceptions. You get kind of this really shallow and wide lake of ideas that come with uh, some of these more basic certification organizations like ISC squared and, and CompTIA, where it, it's really shallow and really wide coverage and nothing, you know, it, it's, it's not really too diverse. Uh, and when we talk about hiring, if you're looking for jobs, really you want to look geographically because you're going to see those differences and they're very, very subtle differences. Uh, you know, if, if you're looking for jobs in Cleveland, Ohio, for instance, they really like ISC squared. If you look in Toledo, they like, you know, security plus, they like CompTIA and you see, as people come up in the field, everybody in that area typically has similar or the same certifications. And we need to get past that. And, and again, as I was talking to your point originally, we really need to start thinking about uh, organizational and cultural change where we start thinking about, hey, this may not be the best thing going. There may be other opportunities. So, and we talk about that again, the bullet point single training pathways. OSCP is the perfect example, right? The, the pen testing world is plagued by that certificate. Why? Because everybody has to do the same thing. And it's the only thing that's widely accepted. Uh, and then finally, we have a lack of ownership from growth or for the growth and improvement of the field. Again, we have people who are worried about their own careers. They're not worried about, you know, crafting and molding those who come after them. And, and we just get people kind of left to themselves. And then we got a few things over here on the right, uh, talking about the massive amount of jobs that are unfilled. Talent crunch, three and a half million jobs unfilled up there, 918,000 
you know, tech jobs from CompTIA. And then you have my little book down here that I blasted out, which actually landed me my job that I have now. Um, I can mentor people, I can stream, I can teach, I can help people get jobs, but I wasn't able to get a job myself. And, and these are kind of the things that we're all challenged with and we're all struggling with in the industry. And we really need to, you know, have this conversation about how do we improve it and how do we improve that path for those coming after us. And again, there's really no shortage of talent. We have lots of talent. There's lots of people who are able and willing to do these jobs and perform these duties. There's just a shortage of open-minded managers that are willing to train and take a chance on somebody. Nobody wants to train anymore. They just want the unicorn, right? So enduring the suck, we're gonna have to do some work before we can really get to the point where we can institute this uh, shift, you know, this paradigm shift and this cultural change from figure it out yourself to really helping that person who's coming after you. And for those of us in the military, we understand this term all too well. You know, as an infantryman, I always tell myself put that left foot in front of the right. We have to keep moving, whether it sucks or not, we got to keep moving. And, and really IT and the civilian world in general is no different. And when we're getting our butts kicked, we really need to start thinking about what else we can do to adapt to overcome those challenges. Uh, and as I was talking about a minute ago, I applied for over 50 jobs. I never got a single interview. I never got a single email back saying that, you know, hey, you know, you're missing this or you would do well to do this differently. It was your credentials are impressive, but we're going somewhere else. Or, you know, you don't have three to five years experience. You don't have what we're looking for. You don't have the, you know, the training or whatever it is. And eventually I just figured out the problem wasn't me. It's the process, right? And I figured that out because I finally got a job and it was because I was able to get in front of people who were decision makers and I got out of the typical process uh, that we were in. There are people out there who care about making this, you know, making this place and this world and this industry better. They truly exist. They are out there. We need more of those people. And so what did I do? I adapted and I kicked its ass. You know, what, what else are we supposed to do? We just kick doors in for a living. We just chase bad guys down and do you know, all that military stuff. Uh, so I adapted, I overcame, I stopped doing what was failing, which is just applying for jobs. And I started something else. I adapted, I swallowed my pride and I asked for help, which was one of the more difficult things that I've ever done. And as you see, a few very kind hearted people took a chance. I, I sent out that post you see there on, on the screen. Uh, it, 8,000 people saw or, or whatever that says. I ended up with three job interviews out of that and two job offers. Why? Because there was a few people out there who saw and agreed that, hey, this isn't working for the industry. We need to give people a chance. We need to talk to them, see what they're capable of. And we need to see what we can do to better this place. And when I was able to get past that process because of these very, very kind-hearted people, uh, I was successful in proving my value and my worth. And we need more of this. And we really, really need to think about this organizationally. Uh, when we're looking at hiring, when we're looking at bringing in the next generation of security professionals, pen testers, help desk, systems admin, networking admins, et cetera. We really need to start thinking about how can we make this better? Why are we just gonna keep perpetuating something that isn't working? This job has been open for 10 months and we can't fill it. Is it the, is it the applicant's you know, issue at that point or is it the organization? And the issue every time is gonna be the organization. They're just being too stingy and too tough and they don't want to take ownership of the process by hiring, training, and molding to the corporate, and, you know, the corporate culture and the organization and the industry itself. So where are we at, right? Well, we're molded by our experiences. Everything we do, every behavior, mannerism and response we do is created and learned from somewhere, right? For us, people like me, people like all of you who have struggled sometimes to get where you're at, you've had to fight, you've had to you know, blood, sweat, and tears. You, you've had to battle every step of the way. It's treacherous. It's hard. It's mentally demanding. Some, it's very trying. Sometimes you feel like quitting. And there's always a choice, though. And, and what can we do once we get to the point where we're no longer in that struggle, but instead we're looking at the other people who can struggle now? and we have that choice forward. So we can do a couple things, right? We can just take the path of perpetuation. That's where the industry is right now. Process was a pain, but now that my foot's in the door, what do I care? I'm here, I don't care, I'm, I've got my job, I've got that experience factor, it's gonna fill my resume in. I'm taken care of for the rest of my career, right? 
I've got that bullet. Every time I apply for a job, somebody's going to answer because I have the experience. I'm going to get on LinkedIn. I'm going to say, hey, look, I'm looking for a job. And here comes the headhunters. The recruiters are going to be bashing your door down, bugging you every single day of the week, trying to get you to sign up for their positions. They're actually going to follow through. They're not going to be disrespectful, contact you, and then ghost you. They're going to want you, right? Because you're in the door. So you could go that way. Hey, I'm there. I don't have to worry about it again. You could have a chip on your shoulder. This process really sucked. I'm mad and angry about it. I'm going to make sure that everyone else has to go through that same pain that I did. If I had to go through it, so should everybody else. I only needed one specific certification to get where I'm at. And now I'm going to expect everyone else to go because they need the same training as me, right? You know, why should they be allowed to do something else? I had to go through the OSCP. I had to do the SSCP. I had to do, you know, Security Plus or CEH. Why should everybody else not have to do the same? And I'm not worried about the industry because I have a job now. It's not my problem, right? You know, that's the path of perpetuation. That's where we're at currently. We can just stick with it if we want. That's the easy road forward. I won't be the only person to go through all this. If I had to do it, I'm making sure everybody else must as well. Or we can take the high ground. We can take the more difficult or challenging, but in the end, the far more rewarding path, in my opinion. And we can try to improve the, you know, the process for everybody else who comes after us. We can look at it. This process was difficult, but now that I'm in the door, I want to make sure others don't endure the same struggles I had to. Sorry, my throat's dry. You know, I possess the mental toughness to get through it, but others coming after me may not have the same. I really don't want others to have to go through what I did to get here. I'm open-minded about alternative training opportunities to include those that don't significantly limit others with lower incomes. Looking at, you know, the OSCPs, the CEHs of the world, you know, ten, fifteen hundred dollars per course. You learn security until their new pass coming up next week, same exact way. These courses are massively expensive, you know, and they really limit people who have talent from entering a field essentially because they don't have the financial means. So being open minded, maybe you don't have somebody who has a certificate, but maybe they do have the training and experience. And I take ownership in the industry because improving my surroundings and the process for others. Uh, brings benefit to the industry and my team and my organization as a whole. I want to be the only person who goes through this, right? I would rather it be me and not somebody else. You know, that's kind of the, you know, the, you can see the difference. You have somebody who just doesn't care and you have somebody who just wants to culture and mold and improve. Good to see we've got more people coming in. So, <laughs> a great quote. I, I love Mr. Rogers. Uh, and so we're now kind of to the mentoring point, right? Um, and, and, you know, Mr. Rogers, if you've ever read about him or, or you know, read biopics or, or anything about him, uh, this quote has always stood out to me more than anything else he's done. And it's that part right there in the center that says, look for the helpers, right? When you're new to the field, it's a big world. That first time you click into a Discord channel, that first time you enter, you know, a Slack channel or a Teams meeting, uh, or you know, a Udemy help, you know, Q and A. You've got this whole huge unknown world in front of you, and undoubtedly, you're wondering what direction to go to. And what do you do? I know what I did. I looked for helpers, right? I looked for people who knew what they were doing, and people who I knew were going to be good, uh, well-hearted, and kind folks who wanted to improve things. And those are the folks that we look to when we're new, right? Those are also the people that look at us when they're new and they're looking for help and advice and expertise and, you know, the, the direction forward. Uh, you know, the people who don't know how to turn on the computer for the first time or, or install Kali Linux. Uh, they might not know Burp Suite or how to, you know, change a browser. Um, you know, these are people who at one point we were in the same position and, so I, right there in the center, just, you know, everything I've always done in this field has been right there. Look for the helpers, but from the opposite perspective, for the most part, to be the helper that somebody is looking at. So that goes towards the importance of mentorship, right? There's no hard stop on mentoring. You, you can mentor from your second day and you can mentor from your first day. And, you know, if you learn something, there's going to be somebody around you that doesn't know what you just learned. At some point, they're going to have the same questions that you did prior to you learning it or understanding whatever that concept is. And it doesn't have to be a formal relationship. In the last uh, video, 
or, you know, right before the lunch hour, we were talking a lot about this right here and mentoring uh, and how we can help people and uh, make the industry better. It doesn't have to be a formal relationship. Simply answering questions with something more than Google it or try harder is, is mentoring, right? Uh, being available to just want to help, want to improve and really make things better for those who come after us. You know, that's what mentoring is about. Yeah, having a mentor-mentee relationship is great. I mentored a young man uh, at a local high school for several years, and it was, it was wonderful. And it's not only wonderful for him, it's wonderful for us too. You know, giving back and helping others is really, really rewarding. Uh, it can be stressful sometimes. It can be frustrating. But being able to help somebody grow and see and be able to track that progress uh, is really, really rewarding. <clears throat> you know, it helps us also give back to the industry, right? If we're helping somebody who's going to be the next, you know, generation or the next year of employee coming into the pipeline, making sure that they're trained and ready to, to enter the next open position at your company or in the field is really, really important, right? Because we're only as good as the people that are within cybersecurity or within IT, uh, you know, break fix support or networks or pipe fitting or, you know, masonry, it doesn't matter what industry it is. We're only as good as the people who are in it. And if we aren't making people that are coming in as good or better than we are, we're not bettering our organization, our field, or the world. You know, we're, we're never getting anywhere. There's no progress. There's no change. There's just nothing different. Everybody's always going to be the same with the same skill sets, the same abilities, and we don't get anywhere. Here on this fourth bullet is one that's really, really important to me. Um, <clears throat> because when we help others, we help ourselves. You know, a lot of what we do are, you know, and a lot of the tools and techniques and things we use in IT uh, are skills that we can quickly forget if we aren't using them regularly or if we aren't referring to our notes regularly or we aren't talking to somebody uh, about those techniques and tools. You know, we can't be expected to be a master of everything. We can't know everything. It's just not possible. So the way for us to you know, there, there's different ways for us to be good. We can consistently practice. Uh, but one of those things that we really can benefit uh, from mentoring somebody is that right there. We're continuing to stay fresh and on our game because we're having a reason now to go out and look at those notes, look at those old skills uh, that we may need to, you know, stretch the muscles we, we haven't used in a long time. We may have to shake the cobwebs out on, uh, on that skill or technique, but it gives us the opportunity to do that and to help somebody in the process. And again, it, help, it just feels really good sometimes when you, know, you see somebody who needs help, they're struggling, and you just step up and you're that person in the room. You're that helper that they're looking for. And you help them get over that hump. You know, they're working on a lab challenge. They're trying to pass a test or they fail an exam and they need some help getting to the point where they're gonna pass it next time. It doesn't matter what it is. It's going to feel good, though, to be a part of their success story, right? Because you're the one who, you know, you may have had a small or a really big part in it. And to me, it doesn't matter. But you've been instrumental in that person's success. And there's seven and a half billion people on this planet. And you've been able to make an impact on somebody who's probably going to make an impact somewhere else in the future. Not everybody's going to remember this. There are some people who get help and they move on because it's very transactional. Hey, I need help with something. Okay. They don't say thank you. They don't help you, et cetera. The ones that really matter though, are the ones who, you know, message you. They're the ones who post on Twitter. Hey, you know, I got, I passed this test. Thank you so much. You know, so-and-so, uh, you know, you're the only person they contact and say, Hey, look, I passed this exam because of you. Or you see them helping somebody else down the road with the same thing that you were helping them with when you, you know, encountered their issue as well. It's just so rewarding. It feels just so good sometimes to be that helper, right? To be that person, you know, at their dire moment, whatever it might be, to be that person in, in their dire moment to help pick them up, get them going forward and help them succeed. And in the end, it really just is important for us to remember what it was like to be that person. If there's anything whatsoever you take from this talk today, it's going to be that last bullet right there. Remember what it was like to be the little guy. Remember what it was like to be that person who's looking for help, who's looking for a helper, who's looking for mentorship, who's looking for training or, or answers to whatever the issue is that they're facing. And no issue should be too big or too small. There's never going to be an issue that the response should be Google it. There, there really shouldn't, in my opinion. 
because yeah, we can tell somebody to Google it, but even then, Googling things is a skill that we have to work on culture mold and get better at. So just remember what it's like to be that person who doesn't even know what they're looking at, let alone what to Google at that moment. Take them under your wing, even if it's for a moment, give them that hand, give them that chance. You could be making it so they stay in the industry or that they might go somewhere else because they think they aren't worth it and can't cut it. So some marching orders, right? So we're kind of closing in here. Um, and somewhere in the future, you're gonna have to make a choice, perpetuation or change. I challenge you to remember what it was like when you're the one being judged in that moment, right? And the challenges you're forced to do, you know, that you face to get there. You're that new applicant or you're looking at that new applicant coming into your company and you're wondering, is this person gonna be, you know, a good success in the company? Are they gonna fit well? Or maybe you're just receiving, hey, can you give us some input on hiring for this position? What certificates, what training do you think they should need? How much experience do you think they should need? And keep that in mind. Look back at this talk and look back at your own challenges and the own, your own path that you took and think about how hard was it? How much did you hate it? How much do you want somebody else to hate it? Or how much do you wanna fix it for someone else as well? and help them forward or make them get stuck behind? And will you choose to maintain the status quo you faced? Or are you gonna make the process better for those who come after you? Only you know the answer to that. And it's only gonna be able to be answered when it gets to that point where you're being challenged with it. Be the helper in the room, plain and simple. If you can do it, be the helper. And for us who are in the military, we live that life. We live that, self, you know, that selfless life for a long time. We put country, teammates, everybody in front of us. Uh, it's hard out here in the civilian world to find that same thing because people just weren't molded and, you know, really just crafted and grown to that mentality the same way we were. So show them that there's an alternative way to do things. Be that helper. Someone took a chance on me when nobody else would. More than one person. Cyber mentor, Heath Adams, took a chance on me with an internship. I will be forever grateful to that man because of what he did and what he offered me. The job I have now, I chewed through 50 plus applications with no success whatsoever and was turned down for no other reason other than didn't you know, meet the checkbox. Or I could be like the two or three people uh, who took a chance on me, my current you know, supervisor, you know, the other folks who reached out to me on, on that LinkedIn post and said, hey, I don't like that this is the way things work. Somebody gave me a chance. And, and the one lady, literally that's what she led with was, Somebody gave me a chance at one point in my career, and I really want to help do the same thing now. How can I help you? I want to get your resume to my hiring team. I want to get you a job. And two out of the three of those opportunities is what got me where I am today. And I'll be forever grateful for it. And it's because of that impact. It's because those people gave me that chance that's going to motivate me even more to want to better the process forward. And I encourage you all to consider doing the same. And I know which way I'm going. You know, I, I'm an agent of change. This, this is what I've done my entire adult life. You know, I, I've worked in nonprofits. I've been a paramedic. I was in the army. I've been a mayor because my town needed leadership. You know, I, I've, you know, my whole life, it's what I've tried to do is improve the way forward. And many of you have done the same. I hope that you're going to join me in that path of trying to improve things going forward. Ian, I'll get to your note in just one sec. So we'll open it up here uh, to questions. You see uh, some contact information here on Twitter at Joe Helly. Uh, Twitch, if you want to check in and watch some videos, we do pen testing tutorials. Not so much as I was before now that I've got the new job, but I do need to get a streaming schedule back up. Uh, we usually do that for about an hour a day. It's very educational, very instructional, uh, and just a way for me to give back. I've got some videos on YouTube there. Uh, and if you want to friend me on LinkedIn, just go ahead and say, I saw you on this talk today in a message and I'll go ahead and accept you. I don't accept people typically who don't send a message with their, uh, with their invitation or request for connection. So if you want to join, uh, if, if you want to follow or chat on LinkedIn, I, I highly recommend it. Just go ahead and send a message on there when you uh, send the, uh, the request that says, I saw your talk today at VetSecCon. And then I've got a link there for MayorSec Discord. It's good for one day. If you want to join my small little community, we have about 700 members. Uh, I'd say we have 50 or 60 who are active, and we have a lot of folks with the same mentality as me who want to help others, who want to help improve 
and make things better for everybody else. So uh, if you're in that mindset or if you're looking for somebody who has that mindset, please feel free to join. Uh, I'm on there all the time myself. I'm constantly talking and being, uh, you know, in, in chatting with folks and helping others. Uh, and, and really, really an encouraging and wonderful little community. Uh, and if you're looking for that kind of home, uh, I, I highly recommend and encourage you to join. So uh, Ian says, I know people who won't mentor because they're concerned attempts to do so would be misconstrued. Um, I'm not sure what that means necessarily. Uh, how do you get HR involved inside a business? How do you do this outside of business? Uh, hitting on people, got you. Um, in the end, it's going to be a lot about professionalism, right? We, we have to be considerate, professional in everything that we do, and we need to consider other people. Uh, I've not had uh, the, I've not been approached by or ever had that concern where I would think that uh, there would be any amount of sexual harassment or, you know, misconduct like that in anything I've done. Uh, I've always looked at people as the question or the need of help that they have. I've never looked at them as gender, race, creed, you know, religion, political party, being a, you know, an ex-politician. I've never looked at them like that. Um, and, and I would just encourage you, if you're looking to mentor somebody, to keep that in mind. Uh, oftentimes when we're doing it, it's not going to be in voice. It's going to be in a chat program or, you know, a discord, a Slack, uh, team speak teams, whatever it is, you're going to have a chat record as well. So you can always keep track of and protect yourself in that case, if it's concerning for you, uh, you know, same thing if you're, if you're emailing contacts, et cetera, uh, in the end, I would be less worried about that kind of thing. Uh, if somebody's reaching out for help and you're saying, I would like to help you. I would hope that their interest isn't to, you know, get you in trouble or get you fired or something like that, uh, if that's what you're getting at. In terms of how do you get HR involved inside a business, that's going to be a leadership function, I think. And it's going to take cultural change and direction and open-mindedness. So oftentimes HR is going to look to, you know, line managers or department managers or practice managers and say, hey, you know, you've said you want to hire for this position. What do we need for that position? Hopefully, your whoever that leader or director or manager is is going to reach down to some of you folks who are on the line and say, "Do you have any input on this?" And hopefully, they'll do that. And hopefully, you can answer, "Yes, I've got some input. I'm not sure this should be the only certification we accept." Hey, you know, I think that we can handle taking somebody with less experience and being able to train them. I think that would be a good idea because we can mold them to our organizational culture. In addition, there is business benefit to uh, doing that exact thing, right? The better you treat people, the longer they're gonna work for you. And if you bring people on, you give them that feeling of a chance and an opportunity, hopefully they're gonna work hard and they're gonna repay you tenfold, you know, through longevity and service, through harder work, uh, and through the same mentality down the road when they have the same opportunity. From outside the business, you know, you, you can be involved. Uh, you can find professional groups. You can find professional organizations. Uh, yesterday, for instance, and we'll just pick on offensive security since that's kind of my thing. They just released an announcement that they are now going to provide instruction with their PWK labs with their instructional material. Now, I know that offensive security and all of that isn't necessarily the job field, but there are ways to make, you know, changes across the culture. And that's something that me and a few people have been pushing really, really hard on for many months publicly is, for instance, that training disconnect. You have all this, you know, these materials, this massive PDF, and you have this PWK lab that's completely disconnected. They now just announced, hey, we're going to do this differently. Hopefully I had something to do with it. I'm not sure if I did, but there was a lot of us kind of really pushing for that change. And that's what it takes outside the business. It just takes change and it takes wanting to craft and mold the industry as a whole. And the only way we can do that is through pressure. We just have to pressure the industry to uh, conform and change and uh, you know, make sure that those opportunities come up. Oftentimes those changes are gonna have to come internally. Uh, you know, down the road, folks like us who are being hired to positions are gonna have those opportunities down the road to institute that change in that influence. And we just have to be cognizant that when we get to that point, the things that, you know, seem the way they are for us then aren't necessarily going to be the same way things are for the person coming in. So we need to keep our ear to the ground 
uh, as well and try to not forget where we came from. You know, we, we need to consider what it's like for that, that entry level person coming in. So what advice do you have for those still on active duty uh, or still on the outside of InfoSec trying to get in? Uh, I cannot recommend enough the value of networking. It cannot be understated or it cannot be overstated, sorry. The value of networking cannot be overstated. Join those discords, join those slacks, find those people on LinkedIn. Don't just send blank, pointless, you know, invitations or, or requests for connections. They're going to be deleted by most people. Why? Because they don't know who you are. They don't know why you're sending it. And we're there for, you know, when you look at LinkedIn and environments like that, it's a professional development and really just kind of a professional networking environment. People have to have a reason to want to network with you. So if you say, I met you at a talk, or I see that you're working, you know, in Toledo, Ohio, or Columbus, and I pick on Ohio because that's where I'm from. Uh, I see you working in this industry in this state. I want to break into the industry. I was hoping we could connect and see if there's some way that, uh, you know, if you would be willing to share some pointers or tell me about the, you know, the field where we're from, et cetera. Uh, in network, network, network. If you're still in the service looking to get out and do that transition, look beyond the taps, look beyond your, your transition process within the military. Start looking six months to 12 months ahead. You know, the military has gotten good about giving more time for transition. You know, and, you know, when I was still in, you know, the transition point was literally, hey, you just got back from deployment, and you're about to ETS. You know, go sit in class for three days, you're honeymooning because you just got back from Iraq or Afghanistan. You're honeymooning because you're 24 years old and you're an E4 ready to get out. You don't care about anything else. You know, you got GI Bill, what do I care, right? And you're young and immature at that point. Now you know, they're giving you six months, 12 months for that transition, but you're still kind of geographically locked. You're still not sure if you're going to stay or go. Uh, and a lot of those opportunities that come in taps is simply for where you're at, you know, around whatever military installation you're in, Tom. So if I was still active duty, I would, or if I was talking to somebody active duty, I would start saying, look for, start looking for jobs sooner than later in the area that you're going to start networking, reach out to those professional groups. There's an ISC square, you know, uh, group in many, you know, many cities, there's CompTIA groups, there's, you know, ISACA groups and ISSA groups, et cetera. Uh, additionally, hit those Slack and Discord channels and say, hey, you know, I'm about to transition. Does anybody know of any opportunities or, you know, is anybody from this area that I could talk to? I think you're going to be surprised at the amount of people who are going to say, yeah, I'm from, you know, Chattanooga. Hey, I'm from Charlotte, uh, who might be able to help you. And again, network, network, network. Uh, and then that's really the same thing for people who are still on the outside of InfoSec. Find those communities, find that interest, make sure it's whatever you're looking at, you're actually interested in first. It, you know, there's a lot of time and financial commitment to get into this field. It's not cheap and it's not easy. Uh, you know, I've got thousands of hours at this point between bachelor's degree, working on the master's, going through ECPBT and OSCP and all the certificates, uh, plus the internship to get to this point. It was a massive time sink. It was a massive requirement. And you have to consider all of these things when you're saying, do I really want to do this or not? So know what you're getting into. And again, networking is going to help you understand that. If you're just Googling, you're going to see Google say, get your CEH and you're going to be employable. You're not going to be because nobody knows you and you know nothing about the industry at that moment. So network, network, network. I cannot, I, I cannot encourage you all enough to network uh, into the field. It is what got me where I'm at today. It's what's gotten a lot of people where they're at today. It's not through, you know, just kind of the, the typical run of the mill application process. 100% networking time. Uh, Jack, haven't agreed with so much in a presentation in this area in a long time. Thank you so much, Jack. I really appreciate it. Uh, positive belief and ability to change is a step zero so many people have trouble with. Um, it, it is. And I think you would never believe it, but I'm highly introverted. Like, uh, I, I can talk in front of people, you know, it's, it's what I've, I've been forward facing for a long time. But the second I get off, you know, this chat here, I don't want anybody to talk to me. Uh, I'm happy just being left alone. Um, but it's, you know, it's really tough. But for people who can do it, I really encourage and recommend that they do. Uh, because the value that you're going to provide for others is really, really going to be beneficial. And it pulls me out of my shell, right? 
there was a time in life where I couldn't go to Walmart during the day, you know, just battlefield you know, trauma and, you know, the fear of crowds. I was in Iraq during a surge. It sucked. And crowds just freaked us out. And, you know, I, I carried that with me for a long time. You know, there was a point where I wasn't willing to come out of my shell. Uh, doing things like this has really helped me grow, improve, and be a better person just mentally and physically, uh, but as well as professionally. And, you know, for those who can give back, you really should. You know, it, it can be trying, it can be testing, uh, it can take up a lot of time sometimes, uh, and, and there's a balance that has to be struck. But the benefits to yourself, if you do it correctly, are just going to be so, so great. Um, and the impact you make on others, you know, there, there's so many people and, and I'm, this isn't a gloat or an ego boost. Well, it might be an ego boost a little bit, but there's just been so many people, you know, when I see at Joe Helly helped me pass my OSCP, I just like, I grin from ear to ear, right? Uh, I helped somebody do one of the toughest things they've done in the field. Uh, you know, Hey, at Joe Helly, I got my first job because of your screens or, you know, something like this, or I passed a test or whatever it might be it's so rewarding. I don't do it for the reward. You know, I'm not putting a mirror in front of somebody and saying, Hey, you're doing this for you. Um, it feels good. And I, you know, the appreciation is really something that feels great, but I do it just because I care and I want to make things better. Uh, and I totally, totally just recommend and encourage everybody in this chat. You guys tuned in for something. Um, you know, hopefully it was because you guys want to do something similar and help. Uh, in my opinion, military commanders should be required to send everyone to TAPS every year. So it reminds I think that'd be a good idea. I think that a lot of the challenge is the maturity differentiation between your senior leaders and your junior leaders as well, or even your junior enlisted soldiers, right? Your officers, you know, even if you're a second lieutenant, a first lieutenant, whatever it is, you're 24, 25, whatever, you know, You've made it some years. You've done some things. You've been an adult on your own. A lot of people come in, you know, off, off the graduation stage like I did. You know, you're heading right to the bus. You're getting on the airplane. You know, you're stepping into the footprints or onto the line or whatever you do in your branch. And you're brand new. And you're, all, and you're like a brand new adult when you come out. You know, you go in, you're this well-crafted soldier. But the second you leave, that culture is gone. And the only thing holding it together is your discipline level but a lot of people short time. As soon as they hit that six months, it's time to transition period. You know, they start letting their hair grow. They start letting their beard grow. They don't show up at PT. They don't care anymore, right? And that discipline starts to wane the closer you get to your paper. And so I think you're right that some of that has to happen. I think that our leadership, our senior leaders need to put more emphasis on what it's like to be that younger person getting ready to transition as well. You know, your, your E7s, your E8s, your E9s, they're short timing on their own period, right? They're short timing because they're about to get out. You know, they, they've had enough time in service to have kids. They've got bachelor's and master's degrees. You've got a doctorate degree. You've gone to, you know, the award cap. You've done whatever. I mean, you've lived your adult life to that point. You've got a lot of people who came out of high school completely immature. And the first time they've tasted civilian life again is right after the military service. And they go from well-disciplined, well-trained to what the hell do I do next? So I think our senior leaders in the service need to keep that in mind as well. It's going to take more than just the transition period. It's going to take maturity and helping people understand and know when they get to that transition point, really what the importance of it is. Your senior leaders understand it. They're 35, 36, 40, 50, whatever it is. They understand. I have to step back out into adult life, but I've been a manager for a very long time. I've had a lot of responsibility for a very long time. E3, E4, they haven't had to do much, but, you know, clean a weapon, you know, carry a rucksack, et cetera. Uh, and they just lack the maturity for, for that release sometimes. So we need to keep that in mind. <laughs> Relatable to the last four to five months. Yeah, you just short time. You're ready to go. You know, you, you got your ETS papers and you're checking out a base. You've turned in your CIF and you know, you've gone over to the TAPS office, you sat through the classes half asleep because, you know, you've been staying up late playing video games, uh, and you're just there for the signature. You know, when I got out, I was there for the signature. I didn't care. But I had a plan. I was going out, I was getting out, and I was going to be a paramedic, and that's exactly what I did. There's just a lot of people who come out with no plan. Uh, when you started the transition, was it only network, or was there any mentor that you idolized? Um, so I... 
when I transitioned out of the army, I was on my own, right? That was 2011. I worked some jobs. I started a business. I, I had the responsibility of running the, the distillery and being a business you know, owner. Uh, I saw lack of leadership in my community, so I ran for mayor. Um, but I had been a leader before, right? I, I was a, you know, a sergeant. I was a section sergeant, a platoon sergeant for a while in the army. You, know, you had that responsibility to other people underneath you. It's a lot different than just being responsible for yourself. So you're able to carry that with you a bit. It wasn't until I left politics that I was lost really for the first time in my life. I felt like I was walking off the graduation stage again because I didn't have a plan. And it wasn't until last December or January that I found that mentor, that person who, uh, you know, I could say, hey, you know, tuning into this guy every day or talking to him is, is really helpful. And when it comes to Heath Adams, I just saw his LinkedIn. I saw he's from Rossford, Ohio originally. I mean, that's 30 minutes from where I grew up at. Uh, so I just sent him a random message that, hey, I grew, you know, I'm from Oak Harbor. We grew up close to each other, right? And then just kind of sparked this conversation. I'm not saying necessarily just start messaging random people. Uh, you know, look for something you might have in common. But that's really what kicked it off for me. It was a lot of self-study as well. I went through the bachelor's degree at WGU. I did it in 12 weeks. Uh, I had an associate's going in, so I had all my, you know, basic courses done. But I finished the bachelor's degree in cybersecurity in 12 weeks, just through 80, 90 hours a week. It just grinded away. But I got to the point where I couldn't get jobs even as a help desk technician because I didn't have enough experience and it pissed me off. You know, I got mad. So I started looking for other alternatives into the field and I found pen testing. And I'm like, you know what? I can get into pen testing. I can figure this out. And it, plus it really interested me. Uh, so I started looking for leaders in the pen testing field and Heath was one of them. You know, I got on his discord after I got my EJPT from eLearn. Uh, just started talking and, and being helpful in, in the discord and it got noticed. Uh, and, and from there, you know, it just, it kind of, I don't want to say shot out of control, but the opportunity started opening up more and more. So to answer your question, Finn, I would say that it was a combination of both. Um, there's too much in this field of you have to figure things out on your own. Uh, you know, that offset try harder parrot mentality, you know, try harder. Uh, um, there's too much of that mentality where everybody thinks because they had to make it themselves that everybody else has to do it as well. It's not handholding to learn differently. Uh, not everybody learns by, you know, reading, you know, 800 page PDFs and figuring it out or Googling. Sometimes, you, you know, people learn, you know, in a different way. They have to see it first before they do it. So if there's anything else other than don't forget where you're from, really just remember that right there. And it's, you know, not everybody learns the same. You're not a lesser person because you don't learn uh, the way everybody else did it. So if there's no other questions, I know my time is up. I didn't think it would last this long. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tom and Jack so much here for having me uh, and the entire VetSec community. Make sure that if you're not a part of their Slack, if you use Slack, uh, make sure you get on the VetSec Slack. Additionally, I've got my contact information here uh, on the screen. I, I encourage you to, to join the Discord channel. Come hang out. Uh, we're, we're a very approachable community. We do some giveaways once in a while. Uh, and, and it's just a, it's a self-improvement and a community improvement discord. We just want to help others into the field and to continue growing within it. So uh, if you haven't joined yet, please do. Uh, I, I really look forward to seeing you guys over there soon. And I look forward to seeing the rest of that SecCon here as well. So uh, thank you so much, everybody, for the questions and for tuning in today. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Take care, everybody.